Michael Beach. Temo Malakati. Candy Alexander. Jimmy O. Yang. Michelle Monahan. Mark Wahlberg. And director Peter Berg. a well-deserved yeah, Boston is a very small place everybody knows somebody who was directly affected by this but uh, there was um, such an urgency to tell the story that there are actually three different movies um, and I realized you know I do have uh, some say so uh, in the process um, so I figured you know what I might as well get involved so I can control it to a certain extent and make sure that it's dealt with the utmost sensitivity and respect uh, to the victims, as well as uh, the law enforcement and first responders and everybody else who was involved uh, and did such amazing work um, to help uh, not only capture these guys, but just coming together in the way that they did. And that made me extremely proud. And I knew ultimately, you know, Pete was the right guy to handle this because he cares. And this is a movie that's very important. Everybody across the world is being affected by this sort of behavior. And, uh, you know, we have to show them that love will always win. Yeah, Michelle, I want to ask you about the, the responsibility of playing not just a real person, but a real person who lived through these events. Mm -hmm. And what kind of research and prep did you do and how much uh, uh, sort of responsibility did you feel? Mm -hmm. Well, I think any time that you're portraying um, a character or uh, a character in a, um, a tragedy like this, a real historical event, you want to give the utmost responsibility, as you, as you say. You know, when I'd um, read the script, initially I was really um, just taken by the series of untold stories that I hadn't been privy to, you know. I think, you know, when, you, when something like this happens, you sort of just hear kind of what what the news tells you, essentially. You don't really hear the first-hand accounts. And I feel that's really what's so compelling about, about the stories, because you really see um, you know, the people that felt very helpless and vulnerable, um, but ultimately the folks that had all this strength on the day and that truly did heroic things and, and all the acts of compassion. So, um, you know, I felt like that was something that was obviously very, very important and, um, and I really wanted to be a part of being able to tell that story and convey that story. Yeah, Michael, I want to I wanna take that, that question, uh, a next step for you, playing the governor, to you know, someone who you know, is not just someone who was affected <coughs> by this, someone who was calling the shots, catching up with everything that was going on in that day as it happened. It was unprecedented, these events in, in Boston. Um, you know, just the, the bigger challenge for you there and, and the admiration you had for the governor. Um, well, for me, it was obviously I didn't know him prior to this, and I actually <laughs> met him halfway through filming for me. <clears throat> and he, um, I mean, can you imagine being the guy that has to make the decision, um, obviously, with the. Um, input of all these other people that really are the experts at what they do to to be able to say okay this is the path we have to take we have to shut the city down and we have to do it not just for the people of boston but also potentially for the people of new york and who knows where else and when i spoke to him about it he you know he did you know obviously he let me know that it's one of the biggest decisions he's ever made in his life. Wow. And, um, and the weight of it and uh, the possible backlash of it, but, the, but the, the most important thing was the safety of, of the citizens of, um, 
of Boston and, and the surrounding areas. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a really great conversation I had with him. I actually spoke to him for three hours and I, he told me so many things that you wouldn't know, of course. You know, I wanna give a, a, a big shout out and a round of applause for Jimmy Yu Yang. Thank you. And for Timo Minikatsu. Guys, guys, seriously, you guys, that friggin' carjacking <laughs> yeah. is off the friggin' hook. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about, about filming that scene, the, the preparation that you did, um, and how much time uh, did you actually prepare together, or did you prepare separately so that the, the intensity would be elevated in the moments of filming. Let's start with you, Jim. Yeah, um, so we met in rehearsal just briefly, uh, but I think we all kind of on the same page. We didn't want to hang out with each other and be friends. Alex, uh, the guy that played the younger brother, he, he's kind of like, you know, real sprite, like, yeah, let's hang out, let's everybody hang out, play some cards or something. And I'm like, ah, I think, you guys go do some bonding as brothers. I need to get carjacked by you guys. I just kind of went in my own room, and um, yeah, it was definitely it. It, it made it, um, I think, more authentic that way. I feel like you know I can actually be scared now. I actually get to know him. He's actually a super cool guy. <laughs> so it's uh, well, we still s sit like one seat apart. <laughs> yeah, just for safety. You know? well, how was that for you? To, to film that scene as well. Yeah, it was, um, it, it was incredible because um, you know you get into the, you come out the hotel together, you get into the van, you know, go to the set, you're in the makeup together, whatever, and then suddenly I'm putting gun in it. So, but like he said, um, we only briefly met, you know, at the rehearsals, and um, working with Pete, he's so improv improvisational that it helps us as actors to really, you know. To take over the sewing room and, and you know like adventure in our um, in our decisions and our choices, and yeah, um, the first time we filmed it, I remember <coughs> having the gun, and when I when I was pointing at him, it was shaking, and I was I was actually shaking, and I, I I'm, obviously it was on the set, you know, we're just filming whatever, but because of his like his reaction, I was just shaking, and I was getting nervous. And instead of fighting that, you know, that um, feeling, I just went with it because that's what happened. You know, that's probably what happened on, you know, when it actually happened uh, um, in Boston when Dan Danny Man got 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 hijacked. So uh, yeah, it, so again, like instead of fighting it, I, I went with it, and and then it turned out to be a very very chilly chilly scene. Question: Do you think if Don had not escaped, that they would have killed him? I think from um, the perspective of my character, um, he could have killed him, definitely. But from um, the little brother's uh, character, he might have been like, yeah, let me do it, let me do it, let me kill him, let me kill that son of a bitch, you know? But, you know, if he actually had to do it, I don't think he would. Yeah, uh, when I was talking to Danny, he actually said in the back of his mind, he, he, was, he had an image of them shooting him like off of a cliff it was it was in the car and um there was uh one instant where they drove into like this dead end intersection and he was like this is it for me wow. you know um and then i don't know if you know tamlin changed your mind or they actually just went the wrong way they actually turned around so i think the whole time danny did think he was gonna die he might not think he's gonna die right there he think he's gonna drive somewhere very far and kill him uh so that you know i guess gave way to the decision of you know running out and, and the heroic stuff that follows for him. I mean, he, he, he's a real hero in real life. And what's great yeah, about him totally is, yeah. you know, whenever we talk about him, like he doesn't think he's a hero. He's very uncomfortable in like the big events, the after parties, the premieres and things like that. He's just a very normal guy, which is what's great about this, right? Like we can show that normal people can do like such heroic acts uh, in, in the time of need and, you know, bring these guys to justice. Candy, okay, uh, after this movie, for the rest of the day, I'm saying to myself, are there more bombs? <laughs> <laughs> are there more bombs? And I, when I was doing my research for the film, uh, your character doesn't, it's, she's credited as interrogator. Uh, 
Did, did your character like really exist? Like, did that happen? I have to kill you if I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Let, let me let me uh, extend the question by saying that with your your work on procedurals like CSI and ER, uh, how did that um, sort of give you just the um, preparation to play a character like that who just comes in and uh, even the FBI is like scared shitless of her. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the director. It's all about the writing. I got the scene. It was written incredibly. It was right there. There were choices that I made where I felt that the character should be intimidating and Pete said no. No. You, you, you don't humiliate or intimidate her at all. You very calm. He kept the tension and temperature at a certain level at all times. It was, it was a joy to film that scene and we did a lot. We did a lot. So when I actually saw the movie because I never read the script, I only had my scene, I sat there closing night at AFI as an audience member and just loved the film just really had no idea what would be in that scene or not. And the entire movie, ah. I just loved. Yeah. I thought it was great. Just great, heartbreakingly great. You know what I'm saying? Peter, you, you, they were talking a little bit about the improv that they did in some of the scenes. So how do you balance <clears throat> improv with a film like this where you're also striving for accuracy? Because it did just happen. It's only three and a half years ago. I mean, I, I believe um, that if you have talented actors, and I, I was very fortunate to, to have an, a very talented group of actors, um, that if, if, <clears throat> if everybody is comfortable with improvisation, and everybody kind of understands um, the intent behind what we're doing, you, you can actually cr create mo more of an authentic environment. And you know that just happens to be the style that I prefer, um, I think. It was born from being on a TV show, Chicago Hope, <laughs> and we would do 24, 26 episodes a season, and if, if you so much as paused where there wasn't a comma, it was like a red alert. You know, people <laughs> went tactical, and, and phone calls were made, and pan it was real panic, like deep, yes. deep, dark panic set in. And I couldn't, for the life of me, understand it. I felt that, you know, we all had so much more to offer, you know, and, and I think um, if, if, you have actors like this. These these actors are like, you know, souped up, um, high performance vehicles. And if you let them operate and do their thing, they can bring all kinds of, of gifts. And and they all did that. So for me, um, I love improving, uh, and um, I just try and kind of keep it on the tracks. Yeah, you know, Mark. I want to ask you. You are you are a producer on this film as well. And one of the things that I admired about this movie, and I opened up. Q&A with this comment is the points of view, the, the, the FBI, the cops, the paramedics, the victims, the terrorists, uh, I'm sure I'm missing a few people, but everybody, it's a perfect balance. It is a perfect balance of all these points of view. Like, how much did you strive to name, like, uh, I guess, a, a, to maintain that balance to, to, to uh, the biggest challenge to have the balance of all those points of view to, to tell a complete story. Yeah, well, it's obviously it's extremely difficult because you're talking about an event that was you know, over well over 100 hours and condensed into two hours. Um, that's extremely difficult. I don't know, what was the actual running time when you first uh, assembled yeah, your first, the film? first cut. Oh, his, his cuts are always leaner. I'm telling people to put more stuff in the movie. <laughs> He's the complete opposite of most directors will hand in a you know, three hour and 35 minute cut and you're like, oh my God, okay, we gotta have an intermission. <laughs> we're gonna break this up into three movies. What are we gonna do here? But Pete came in like, you know, uh, you know, under two hours and then you kind of figure it out and let it breathe. So he works the opposite way, which is great. Um, so not only is he fantastic with actors, but he also, he gets it, you know, he knows what it's gotta be. And then he'll kind of figure it out from there and he'll expand the film a little bit. But this is obviously, this is the true definition of a real ensemble. Um, and it was still difficult because, you know, there are so many other fascinating elements of the story and things that people did, which was the, the biggest reason why we wanted to create the composite character. 
um, because you know, a if you have to have a central character to follow, um, and I, you know, certain cops did certain things. We wanted to kind of honor all of them at the same time. So it was it was definitely a balancing act. Yeah, Michelle, when you're when you're filming a film like this, a it's based on a true story. B it's based on a a true story that is a. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, another seminal moment of America in the 21st century. You know, what was the point in, during the making of this film where you felt the, where you, I guess, learned things about that day in April of, of uh, 19, 2013 that you didn't even know before? I mean, when I first read the script, I, I honestly didn't know they were on their way to New York. Yeah. Um, that I, I don't know why I, I wasn't privy to that. Um, and that chilled me to the bone, um, thinking if um, Danny hadn't actually been so brave um, that ultimately the same thing could have happened in New York. So that, uh, that really enlightened me and um, scared the dickens out of me, to be quite honest. Um, you know. Well, I wanna ask, you know, some of us on this panel have met there real life counterparts. Some of us didn't, obviously. <laughs> Heather, you did not. Um, so, but I wanna start first with, with Jimmy. You did, you became, I guess, pretty close. Yeah. Uh, wait, how did that elevate your performance, do you think? Yeah, I think Danny was, um, he made himself so available, which was, because at first when I approached him, you know, we're like, well, let's make sure we'll be sensitive about this, because it's a very traumatic event. Maybe he doesn't wanna talk about it, in that much detail, but when I met him, we just kind of hit it off. You know, we're around the same age. We're both immigrants, and um, we're we're both Chinese. Uh, and you know, he 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 he's a, he's actually an app startup guy. Like he actually makes the app, and, and you know, I do uh, I, I I play an actor that makes apps in Silicon Valley. So I think that something with that. And uh, he just he was just so nice and made himself very available and told me all these stories in like really deep details. And um, I think what helped is obviously to learn his mannerisms in real life. You know, it's a little different than watching you know a CBS interview. Um, and beyond that, it, it it's what he was thinking during those moments. Um, you know, he described it as kind of like a mental chess match the whole time. Um, a lot of things he's saying it might not even be exactly um, what you would say in a conversation, like um, when. Tamerlan asked him, is there anybody that care about you? Right, sounds like a really heavy question, but really, in Danny's mind, he, he's just trying to survive, and he's so calm and composed at the time, he's like, okay, if I tell him yes, there's friends and roommates, yeah. he might kill me right here and just push me out of the car. So he, he thought about it, and he was like, no, there's nobody that cares about me here, which sounds like a really sad answer, but really, what it is is he, he's he's trying to just stay alive for one extra minute so he can make that final escape. So yeah, he he made himself very available and uh, it it helped tremendously um, uh, for the for the film. Timo, a flip side is you obviously did not meet your counterpart. So uh, do you feel like that was uh, sort of liberating that you could sort of make the character your own without you know having to talk to somebody or yeah. Um, Obviously, you know, you do a lot of research about the character, <coughs> internet, YouTube, you know, any documentary you can find. Um, he actually, he met a lot of people that knew Tamalan, so got, a, you know, a lot of um, information from Frida as well. And then I also had the chance to meet with, a bo with his uh, boxing coach. And uh, that was, um, yeah, that was very, very weird because you hear him, you know, you hear John Allen is his name, and you hear John talking about him like, you know, straight up dude from Boston, man. Yeah. You know, gets in the gym, gets his gloves, starts boxing, jokes around, whatever, smokes weed, smokes a lot of weed. He has a wife, he has a little kid, you know, and then you hear all this, and then you just start thinking, like, how, how can somebody do this for having, you know, this, you know, this, you know, this life, basically. How, how, why, you know, like you just can't fathom the fact that this actually happened. And this yeah. guy was, you know, he had friends, he had, and, and, and John Allen said, like, you know, I, I like the guy. I like that he was very talented. He was a very talented boxer. Um, you know, but, but something in him, uh, he said, something in him sometimes talking about, especially about, you know, the American culture and the religion, he got very, uh, very offensive very quick, he said. And he got very, you know, defensive too, and some, I didn't like talking about it with him, he said, and I said, yeah, well, that makes sense, that makes sense. 
And, um, and then we started boxing, we started working out, and, and, and I told him like, the moment I get into the into the gym, I want I want you to treat me like I am him. Um, I saw the YouTube videos uh, online uh, when he comes in the gym, takes off his shoe, his hat, whatever. I did all that, you know. And at a certain point, it got so we got so into it. We were doing the pads, me and John, and I was going in, uh, you know, huffing and puffing, and you know, just screaming while punching, whatever. And then at a certain point, he said, "Stop! Stop! Stop!" This is scary, man. This is so scary. And at that point, I knew that, you know, I, I, um, I was, I was in, I, I was almost in that state of mind yeah. that somebody that knew him for five years could be like, please stop, because this is getting uncomfortable for me. So yeah, that definitely helped me. Annie, uh, I, you know, you're t you're talking about the wife, okay? I did not <coughs> realize that was Melissa Benoist. Yes. I yes. didn't even recognize lovely. her. Uh, lovely, and she lovely. was fantastic. Yes. Well, it was like filming that scene with yeah. her because everyone, I think, kind of knows her right now as Super Girl. <laughs> uh, but what was it like filming that scene with her? We did the same thing. We didn't really communicate until it was over. After it was over, and then we saw each other at the hotel. Mm -hmm. Then we were actually able to smile at each other and <laughs> yeah. acknowledge each other. But there was a consultant on set that helped provide all of the energy. And she was a lovely actress. Lovely. Lovely. How many days did you shoot this movie? Um, not that many, right? We shot it pretty quickly. 40, early, 45, thank you. 45. <laughs> <laughs> we, shoot, some we, shoot, we shoot pretty quickly. We yeah. shoot, yeah. We, we, don't, we like to get in and get out and not waste a lot of time. What scene was the most challenging for you to film? In 45 days, by the way. I mean, they're, they're, all, they're all kind of challenging and, and, and I find that every, every time you think something is gonna, um, um, is, is going to, be problematic it isn't <clears throat> one of the challenges with this film was if you if you look at it and you divorce yourself from the reality and the horror of the the, the, the realness of this story the problem from the script standpoint um, you guys are all writers and actors right so if you think about the, the climax of the film isn't the end of the film right so the climax of the film is <clears throat> um, uh, a you know gunfight in Watertown Connecticut there's a big gunfight but then basically you have the city getting shut down and you've got an extraordinary law enforcement res response surrounding you know, an 18 year old kid who shot in a boat. So it's not, there was never really any mystery that he was gonna come out of that boat. <clears throat> so it was kind of figuring out how we, we take the audience through the last 15 minutes of the film and that included uh, you know, Big Poppy and um, you know, Mark was very helpful in getting Big Poppy to come and do that <laughs> shot for us, um, which was really awesome. I mean, he's just such an incredible guy. And his story was remarkable. But figuring out how to kind of keep the, the emotional momentum up um, after that Watertown gunfight was probably the biggest structural challenge that, that I think we all, me and, and my team of editors and stuff faced. You screen the movie publicly for the first time as the closing night of the American <coughs> film, AFI Film Festival. So a lot of people in the film, or depicted in the film, are there. What, what did they think? Well, we made sure that everybody saw the movie beforehand. You guys can hear me, right? <laughs> we made sure that everybody saw the movie well before. This, this is not the kind of movie where you want to just surprise somebody. Yeah. Like, no, 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 wait till the premiere. There's a thousand strangers, you know? It's like not a good idea. Uh, and this is, this is real life and real people, and so we want to make sure that everybody saw the movie. Um, and Pete was was really uh, made sure he was on top of that. Again, personally being there, uh, even when I couldn't be there, to show people. And that's obviously not an easy thing to do. But um, certainly, uh, you know, when it comes to um, certain victims, their families, this is never gonna be, they're never gonna say, wow, I love the movie. You know, you're talking about reenacting the worst event of their life, the worst day of their life. Yeah. Um, but to know and understand and appreciate um, how much we wanted to honor them. Um, that was, <clears throat> it's, not, it's not an easy thing to do, but ultimately, you know, the story is so important 
and we felt like you know what it was going to be told that we were going to tell it yeah because we knew uh how how much we care and how sensitive we are and how much we respect uh, what they went through and so um yeah everybody definitely saw the movie beforehand i want to turn it over to you ladies and gentlemen if you got a question